Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute, and the sponsor for this episode is the Georgian Papers Program. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 176 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. What did it mean to be a person and to also be a commodity in early America? As we know, we can't really understand early American history unless we also grapple with the institution of slavery, because the two are really intertwined. So in this episode, we're going to explore the commodification of enslaved bodies, how early Americans turned people into products to be bought and sold. Dinah Ramey Berry, an associate professor of history at the University of Texas, Austin, and the author of The Price for Their Pound of Flesh, The Value of the Enslaved from Womb to Grave in the Building of a Nation, help us explore this topic. Dinah spent over a decade researching the prices of enslaved people and how those prices fluctuated over the course of an enslaved person's entire life. So as we go behind the scenes of Dinah's research, we'll discover the prices early Americans ascribed to enslaved men, women, and children, the relationship between age and an enslaved person's economic value, and how the end of the transatlantic slave trade and the rise of the domestic slave trade impacted the values of enslaved people. But first, do you like free books? Presses send the Omohundro Institute lots of books for us to feature on this podcast. And some presses send us extra copies of the books that we do feature just so that we can give them to you. The collection of books in my office has now reached a critical mass, which means it's time for another book giveaway. We're going to conduct the next book giveaway the first week of April. To participate, you really need to join our listener community on Facebook because that's where we host the giveaways. Joining is free and easy. Just text BFWorld to 33444 and click the link for the group in the email that I'll send you. Okay, are you ready to explore some of the economics behind the institution of slavery? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, Here is this week's special guest. Joining us is an associate professor of history in African and African diaspora studies at the University of Texas, Austin. She's received numerous awards and fellowships for her research and teaching. And she's the co-author of one book and the author of three books, including Swing the Sickle for the Harvest is Ripe, Gender and Slavery in Antebellum, Georgia, and most recently, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh, The Value of the Enslaved from Womb to Grave in the Building of a Nation. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Dinah Ramey Berry. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for joining us. Now, in your book, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh, you explore how early Americans calculated the value of enslaved people and the ways that enslaved people recalled and responded to their monetary value throughout the course of their lives. How did you come to study how black life was valued and devalued at different points in American history? I mean, how did you come to this topic? So actually, it's a weird way and sort of a simplistic way. I was actually doing research on slave prices, was what I was calling them at the time, for my first book, Swing the Sickle, because I was studying specific plantations. And I had very detailed records on the families and the plantation records. I had information on individual enslaved people and how much they were worth. And I had included that in Chapter 6 of Swing the Sickle, but the editors felt that the tone was different and it just was a separate study. So they encouraged me to think about taking that material out and putting it in a new study. And this essentially became The Price for the Pound of Flesh. You structured this new book, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh, in chapters based on the life cycle of the enslaved. In your six chapters, you really take us from preconception to birth, from childhood to young adulthood, and from middle and older life to old age and death. And I wonder... Why did you choose to look at slavery through the lens of age and economic valuation during those life periods? Does looking at slavery through this lens help us understand the lived experiences of the enslaved and the history of slavery differently? One of the things I found in a number of scholars that do work on slave prices understand that age was a function of value. So enslaved person, if we were looking at their monetary values, depending on how old they were, the prices are going to change. 
a number of other factors, obviously, like skill, their sex, whether or not they're healthy, and whether or not they had specific skills, right? But age was a function of value, and that was something that I paid attention to. But I was also interested in how enslaved people understood themselves in general, and what did they know about their values, and whether or not they thought about this, and when did they understand that they were being treated as a commodity. And because I was asking that question while I was doing the research, I started going back to like, at what age might a person learn or understand that they're being treated as a commodity or a product? So let me start from when they're born. And then I realized as I was looking at the same time at valuation and price patterns based on age, that there was a pricing of enslaved people before they were born. And so I just took that through the whole life cycle because very few scholars, if any, have done work on young children and women or the elderly. Most people that do work on slave prices look at prime age males, usually between 18 and 30 years of age. And so I was very interested in looking at price patterns for women and also children and the elderly. And so I wanted to incorporate the entire life cycle. I didn't want to discriminate against age or sex, and I wanted to cover each phase of their lives. And it seemed to me that the life cycle was the right arc to cover for this particular book. You just noted that the value and price for an enslaved person actually began before they were born. And in your book, you specify that valuation began really as soon as an enslaved woman entered the market as an object and producer of goods. And I wonder, why is that? Why is it that the history of enslaved status always seems to start with women? So I think part of it comes from the fact that women are actually giving birth to slaves, to enslaved people, and also because of legislation. 1662 and 1663 in in Maryland and Virginia, there was a part of secular ventrum law legislation which said that the status of an enslaved person was defined by their mother. So the institution of slavery is really hinging upon women continuing to give birth. And this becomes important as we go through from the colonial period and transition into the 19th century and the early national period the value of women increases slightly because of the fact that they can bring in additional sources of labor. So that's part of the reason that I would say you find this focus on women during this time period and when it comes to looking at why we should consider their values as well. Okay, that's a fair point. So what was the actual value that early Americans placed on enslaved female bodies? And how did prices fluctuate for enslaved women, you know, throughout the course of their lives? So what I found is it wasn't any different than what Fogel and Angerman found, and partly because the majority of my data set, a large portion of my data set comes from the data set that they computed. And that's also been borrowed from work that UB Phillips did back in the early 20th century. So we're using some of the same data. I added some of mine, which I'll talk about in a little bit of research. I did about 8,000 figures in this database that I'm using in this book are from my own research through archives throughout the South. But to answer your question, the values fluctuated over time. And what I've done in this book is converted everything to $1860. So that's not going to be so great for only Americans that are looking for what the price patterns were. But I converted everything from pounds, sterlings into U.S. dollars. And I was doing that so that when I can talk about a value of an enslaved person, I wasn't comparing apples to oranges when I'm talking about different values throughout the book. So you find anywhere from young children that were under age 10, you know, could be about $100 or a little bit less, and then going all the way up to $3,000, depending on what their ages are. The price pattern, though, falls along a bell curve, the same bell curve that UB Phillips found, the same bell curve that Fogel and Angerman found, and their values are increasing until women about age 22 to 25 years of age, which is when they reach their peak childbearing years. And then they start to decrease and males sometimes held their values through their early 30s. And once they reach their early 30s, their values start to drop off as a downslope of that bell curve. Now, Kyle reminds us that in 1806, the United States Constitution abolished the African slave trade to the United States. And he'd like to know whether the abolishment of the slave trade impacted the value of enslaved men and women in North America. And if so, how it impacted their value. So we have some evidence that it did, but I have to say, though, that the domestic slave trade had already been functioning before the close of the transatlantic slave trade. So we do have this push for a market in internal traffic of enslaved people that began really in the 1770s, 1780s, according to Stephen Daly. But when you look at the close of the transatlantic, 
you have already seen before 1808 an emphasis on more women on ships than you did before 1808. But that increase started happening, you know, in that last quarter of the 18th century. And so you do find those kinds of patterns there. Now, because the supply source is being cut off with the close of the transatlantic slave trade, there is more emphasis on natural reproduction. And that's when we see this shift from raising enslaved people to breeding them, which becomes quite common, animal husbandry breeding in the middle to late 19th century. Did early Americans really use those terms to describe enslaved people, breeder and breeding? Yes, actually, I spent a long time trying to figure that out because I saw inconsistencies with the way the term was used in newspaper records. And so in the early chapters of the book, where I'm looking pre-1820, I found that some people were selling enslaved women, quote unquote, because they were breeding, or they were referred to them as breeding wenches, whereas others wanted to purchase people that were good breeding wenches. And so I was trying to understand what that meant. And I realized that there were differences in the term and the terminology and how people understood breeding. In the 18th century, breeding was about rearing children or raising children or taking care of children or nursing them. It wasn't so much like thinking about breeding as a productive factory, like where a woman's body and her uterus is being used for reproductive purposes. So there was a significant difference that I found, and I found that based on the newspaper records in both the North and the South. Wow. Thinking about how early Americans use language to discuss slavery in the enslaved really does give us a sense that they viewed slavery as an economic and husbandry-like institution. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So what other words did early Americans use to describe and discuss slavery in the enslaved? You know, one of the words that you've probably seen in records is the increase. They'll talk about women and their future increase. And what they're referring to is their offspring. So this is how we find evidence of them projecting or thinking about or considering or contemplating what women's values will be and whether or not they're going to give birth to healthy children, healthy progeny. So often they'll talk about she's given birth to one. You know, they'll say we want to know what her future increase will look like. They will price women based on the value of a particular woman and her potential offspring. So because I was mostly interested in individual price patterns. The first chapter that I wrote in this book was focusing on all the values of women and girls that I had up to 1820. And that included, you know, a data set of about 4,892 or something like that. And of those, I was able to look at the ways in which women were valued based on other women as opposed to comparing them to male prices. And that was one place where I could try to look at increase and see whether or not women that were in their childbearing years, which I defined roughly from you know, 16 to 30. And I really did find women in this data set that gave birth, you know, as, as late as 34 years old, which at that time was extremely old for someone to give birth in that time period. Now, earlier you mentioned the domestic slave trade. Would you tell us about that slave trade and how it worked? Yeah. So initially it started off as individual transactions between planters or small farmers that were getting rid of enslaved people or selling them because maybe they couldn't afford them or they had excess enslaved men on the plantation. They started selling them, particularly in Maryland and Virginia. You find those were exporting states where they were sending enslaved people to the deep south. And this also comes at the time of westward expansion. And because of westward expansion, you're now having planters from South Carolina and Georgia moving further west, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. And so this traffic becomes a tight web that's a very organized system of trade, as I mentioned, started loose, but then becomes a very, very organized system where people are placing ads. You have ledger books that incorporate, you know, accounting practices of the traders. You have specific people working to bring enslaved people or coffles down to the Deep South. So you have middlemen, you have brokers, agents, firms, houses, and places of business where they're going to be trading people. And in this domestic slave trade, we know later, we've learned that more than one million individuals were traded in the United States history, were traded as part of the domestic slave trade, which is two and a half times those that were brought directly from Africa to British North America. In the price for their pound of flesh, Dinah notes that the last four decades of the 18th century were really crucial years for assessing the values of enslaved women. Dinah, why were these years so crucial and How did they set the tone for the years that followed in the domestic slave trade? So I think part of it is that even if you look at the transatlantic slave trade database, 
and the new work of Jennifer Morgan that's coming out, Accounting for Women in Slavery, we're finding that enslaved ships were bringing more and more women over as you come towards the end of the 18th century. And some of that has to do with an understanding that it's cheaper to then have women give birth to more enslaved people than it is to purchase them. So that's one of the factors that we see here in the last four decades. There's this hypersensitivity, I say, that this hypersensitive focus on women. And you find that it impacts the way in which people are thinking about who they're going to bring and how they're going to trade people. And then there's also this growing domestic market and trade that's taking off at the same time that's actually succeeding. And they're realizing that, wait a minute, if we make some changes to the way we take care of our human property, we may be able to extend our profits further and we may not need to purchase additional source of labor. You also have increased prices of enslaved people after the Haitian Revolution. And there was a fear of particular ethnic groups, and that's debatable still to this day. But there were commentaries among plantation records, and you find this commentary in newspaper records as well, where they'll talk about people being rebellious. And so they were trying to look for certain enslaved laborers from different parts of West Africa, or they wanted people that were American-born. And you start seeing a preference of that because they were concerned that those that came from different parts of West Africa from particular communities, they felt like they were more rebellious. So that there's always a supply and demand issue here where you're finding the values are fluctuating based on supply and demand, based on legislation, based on the price of the crops as well. So as cotton fluctuates, cotton takes off after 1793 after the cotton gin, you're going to see a slight spike in price increases as well in addition to the Haitian Revolution. Now, before we start breaking down the valuation of enslaved bodies through an enslaved person's life cycle, I think we should talk about sources. In the price for their pound of flesh, Dinah notes that she had a sample of 4,892 appraisals for individual women made between 1771 and 1820. Dinah, would you tell us about these appraisals and the other sources you use to determine the monetary value of enslaved people? First, what I was doing was, as I mentioned, when I was doing the research for Swing the Sickle, my first book, I was collecting any place where I found values, whether they were market sale records or appraisals. And Appraisals were done often in state inventories. You also find appraisals for insurance policies. You find appraisals in probate records, you know, last will and testaments, and also in sales. When enslavers were selling their enslaved people to someone else, they would have a list of how they appraise their values. And then if they were sold, that value might be different. One of the things I found in doing this research is that the market value was often inflated over the appraised value. So in this particular sample, in this chapter, I was looking at all the values of women and 204 of those records come from my own research through different archives. The other comes from the full one Angerman data, which they got from probate records from the Mormon Library in Utah. And so theirs were all appraisals. I had some sale records. I think in this sample, I had about 380 sale records here as well. And my records came from the National Archives and mostly from Maryland and North Carolina planters. So the National Archives records, the material from the war in 1812, as you may know, and some of your listeners will know, during the War of 1812, people started cataloging the loss of their enslaved property. And they were petitioning and writing letters to the state and local authorities asking for compensation. So a lot of these records I use were compensation claims, some of the same records that were used in The Internal Enemy, the prize-winning book by Alan Taylor. And so when you look at these records, they wrote letters and they would say, well, I lost X number of enslaved people. Sometimes they had their names and they would say what they were valued at. Now, when you look at what happened with the War of 1812, they actually assigned a statewide value, a max value for each, whether they were male or female. This is the most that you could get for each individual enslaved person. But I was looking at the records where individual planners were sending in letters and asking for the full value of their appraised value on these enslaved people. So those were some of the records that I used for that. Then I also found just individual plantation records from the State Archives in North Carolina and archives at the Maryland Historical Society as well. You mentioned that enslaved people could have a market value and an appraised value. What was the difference between these two values and how were these two values calculated? That's a really difficult question to answer because there's no consistency that I can tell from individual planters. So if I'm looking at an appraised sheet, unless I'm studying one person, which is why 
throughout the book, I look at some of the covers a little bit later period, but I look at the plantation records of one enslaver that was in Mississippi and Louisiana, only because he had every single year at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, the praise value. And his was very systematic, for instance. He said, you know, for infancy, when they're zero to one, they were just like $20, $25. And then once they reached, you know, a certain age, he would go up in increments of 50 or $25 per year. And that's a very sort of systematic way. But once enslaved people reached age 10, that's when you start to see a difference in the values based on gender. And you also see that those values are fluctuating based on specific skills, maybe their health, maybe their deportment, their personalities. And that's when you can find a little bit more individualization of enslaved people's values. Whereas up until age 10 or a little bit younger, they're almost sort of systematic growth in how those values are increasing slowly as they age. Speaking of enslaved children, I wonder if you would tell us about enslaved children's lived experiences and when enslaved children realized that white people around them were assigning monetary values to their bodies. That's a great question. First, as they look up if they had the parents on the farm or the plantation, sometimes children's values after they reached an age where they can be more specific about it, about their individual values was based on their parents, how healthy their parents were, and if they had siblings that survived past age five that were healthy and working and thriving on the plantation, thriving, I'm using that in huge scare quotes. So they would look at their health and sort of measure that. They would also find out like, okay, the mother is a really good cook or the father is a very good blacksmith. This might be the labor we're going to have them train or raise up their child to do. That's one thing that they're focusing on. But from the enslaved child's perspective, I was trying to understand it literally from infancy on forward. And I think I open up with the story of a 10-week-old baby that's in their mother's arms. I think it's Adeline and her male child. And I can't tell you, you know, we don't have testimony from children that young. But I know that, like, just the descriptions of people at auction scenes and that are witnessing enslaved people being sold. I try to go into those kinds of records and really think about it and try to write the perspective of children experiencing slavery even though I don't know that per se. So for instance, we have this little boy who's in the market with his mother and she's trying to cover him up so people don't see him. She's trying to keep her head covered and the auctioneer keeps taking off this coverlet, as they say, off of her head and trying to expose her and the baby. And you know, the one person that was describing this scene said when they expose the child's face, the child had like a sort of a frown or a weird look on their face. And I mean, I would just say that for me, one of the ways I interpreted that was that Maybe that child understood the way his mother was experiencing the sale. He may have felt distress from her. We know he can't articulate it, but let's try to imagine as scholars and as researchers and as thinkers how people might evolve into understanding themselves as a commodity. You know, we learned from Walter Johnson that their children, they were taught that they were commodities. So enslaved children knew when they were old enough to be taught that by their parents, usually around age six or seven that they were commodities, but they also witnessed sales. If they were not put on the auction block or they were not sold or transferred or deeded or gifted or sold away from their parents, they might have seen it and not understood what it was or might have seen it and asked their family members or other enslaved people about it. So sale was something that was imminent for many enslaved people. We know that the average enslaved person was sold about four or five times in their lifetime. And I think Elizabeth Keckley even talks about how, you know, just witnessing sales at age seven was something that she recalled and thought about over and over and over again. As we think through this example you just shared with us, the mother holding her baby while on the auction block, was there any chance that the auctioneer or her owner would have sold the mother and her child to different people? I mean, could slave owners really sell enslaved children and babies? Yes and no. I mean, there are some states that had legislation that you could not separate mother and child, like in Louisiana, for instance, until age 10. But we have countless records where they were separated. So it might not have been legal to do that, but then the terms of the actual sale in newspapers and broadsides was often printed as families will be sold intact. And then sometimes if they could not, you know, convince somebody to say, well, I want to purchase these two, but not that one. That's where you see this separation happening. Or somebody saying, I don't care. Well, I don't care about the child. Somebody else can take them. Or I don't want to have any small babies on my estate. You know, so you'll see that happening. And this is where we do need more work on sales by lot when we look at these group sales. And it's difficult to parcel out how people are valued in that space individually. Like I had a database that I was creating on mothers and babies, and I had these group sales, but it meant nothing to me if I didn't know the age of the mother and didn't know the age of the child. 
I couldn't really tell what this monetary value meant. If I had that the two of them were sold as a package for 500 and then I saw another coupling of a mother and child with no age and you know no other characteristics, nothing about whether the child was infant or adolescent, and that coupling might have been $1,200. So I couldn't really differentiate what that meant. And so I wasn't able to really explore that. But I do think we need to understand that more because we do find evidence of mothers and children and whole families in the market being sold. And there's a number of scholars that have written about this, those that write about the domestic slave trade. But I still think understanding the childhood experience of slavery and what it might be to be separated and taken away from your parent at the market is something that we can look at and do more research on. Now, like all children, enslaved boys and girls eventually grew up to be enslaved men and women. Dinah, did puberty and maturation impact the views enslaved people had about their value and status? And did puberty and maturation impact white people's views of enslaved people's economic valuation? So it affected their status, for one, is that as they aged, particularly girls, they knew that the value of their reproductive labor was something that planters and enslavers were distracted by. I mean, we find this in newspapers, we find this in letters back and forth, we find this in medical records where they're actually talking about when did the enslaved girls on your plantation have their first menstrual cycle. So we find that some mothers were trying to protect their daughters from that because they were worried about sexual exploitation. They were concerned as you move into the early 19th century about breeding. And that was a concern that continued to the end of slavery in 1865. And so that's one of the things that you find as they grow older, that they realize that they're a commodity and they understand that their value for women and girls is based on the ability to give birth. Men, it's also on labor, but their physical labor and their skills. And women are also valued for that as well. But the childbearing, childrearing is what the focus is for enslaved women and girls. We know that slavery was dangerous for all enslaved people, but from the way you just described it, it sounds like slavery was particularly dangerous for girls who were becoming young women. Yeah, you know, we've had this conversation in class a lot about You know, Harriet Jacobs has this quote that slavery was terrible for men, but far more terrible for women. I'm probably muddying that up a little bit. But she says it was far more terrible for women. We are now learning, though, and I think the forthcoming work of like Stephanie Jones Rogers and a few others, that even boys, young boys were being exploited sexually as well. They couldn't produce additional laborers, obviously. They could facilitate that. Does that make sense? They could facilitate reproduction if they were able to do so. But but girls were actually the ones that held the value because they could give birth to slavery. So yes, it's hard for me to do comparative suffering. I always say this to my students, not to compare the two. But I do have to admit that this fixation on women giving birth does add to a certain level of pressure on girls. And men and boys experience that pressure as we move into breeding in the early 19th century and mid-19th century where men are being forced to breed as well. In the price for their pound of flesh, Dinah notes that enslaved men and women reached their peak monetary values between the ages of 23 and 39. Dinah, what happened to the monetary values of enslaved people as they entered middle and older life? So as they aged into middle and older life, their values were decreasing. If we're looking at individuals, though, I did find that some men and even a few women really carried out relatively decent prices through their 30s. But it really does taper off pretty quickly after that because if we're looking at hands that were given a rated scale where they were judged on the amount of work they could do in a given day, like a full hand, a quarter hand, a three-fourths hand, a half hand, their rates were decreased, meaning their productivity that they could perform, the amount of labor they can produce decreases as they age. But what I argue, though, and a number of scholars have said this as well, is that the value within the enslaved community still remains strong and actually probably increases for some as they age because of their wisdom and their knowledge and their experience with the institution of slavery. And that is something that we cannot commodify. We've been discussing and exploring the valuation of enslaved people in early America in a very clinical sense, if you will. But these were very human people. I mean, we've been talking about human beings. Dinah, How did enslaved people react to their valuations and what did they make of them? So I found a variety of reactions across the board. They did not really care whether or not they were priced high or low. Their main concern was to either be with particular family members or loved ones. So if they were being sold in a public auction, they would beg people to sell them to the same person that their partner was sold to. 
and they would brag about their strength and their skills, and they would say things to encourage people to buy them. And in other cases, if they felt someone was cruel and they had a reputation of being a cruel enslaver, they would try not to be sold, or they would say, I'm not that strong, I'm not that healthy, or I'm sickly. Or women, sometimes when they were interviewed in the auction, they'd say, well, how many children have you given birth to? And sometimes they'd say, it doesn't matter. I don't count anymore because they all get taken from me. So it ranges from apathy to excitement about trying to manipulate who they're going to be sold to or where they're going to be in terms of relationship to their family members. Dalen would like to know if and how the fluctuations in the values of enslaved bodies impacted the ability of enslaved people to buy their freedom. And after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, we will explore an answer to Dalen's question. History and archival work go hand in hand. Letters, journals, and diaries are just some of the key records historians use to better understand the past. In fact, researchers will often spend hours examining and transcribing these different records, all to help them see particular moments of the past better. And they may also spend lots of time and money traveling to archives to conduct their research, too. Although now, research is getting a bit easier and a bit cheaper to do as more and more archives are digitizing their records and putting them up online so that anyone with a computer can examine them. In fact, the Omohundro Institute, the producer of Ben Franklin's World, is a primary partner in one such project to put the entire archive of the Georgian monarchs online. Locked for over a century in the Round Tower at Windsor Castle, the papers of the King Georges, George I, II, III, and IV, as well as of King William IV and all their family members and advisors, are now in the process of being digitized. And historians have only seen a small fraction of what is in these some 350,000 items in this collection. Now, the Georgian Papers program is actually a great opportunity for all fans of history, because soon you can explore these records for yourself and you can help historians and archivists transcribe these handwritten documents as they continue to come up online. If you enjoy exploring handwritten historical documents, you should sign up to be among the first in the Omohundro Institute's team of citizen transcribers. To become a citizen transcriber, just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash transcribe. Okay, back to Dalen's question. Dinah, did the fluctuations in the values of enslaved bodies impact the ability of enslaved people to buy their freedom? And just how often did enslaved people have the opportunity to purchase their freedom or the freedom of a family member? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if we have statistics, to be quite honest, on how many were able to self-purchase, but I know that it is something that they often strive to do, and we find this in a number of records. Not only in enslaved people produce records such as testimonies and narratives, but we also find it in runaway advertisements where they'll talk about this person was running away to go try to purchase their partner, or this person ran away to be with their husband who was just given their freedom or something like that. So you do find that. It's just, I don't know that we can actually commodify or count or calculate that. I don't know that there are any scholars that are doing that. I don't know that we have the capacity to do that. Now, the monetary valuation of enslaved bodies continued even after an enslaved person's death. Dinah, how did enslavers find ways to profit from the bodies of enslaved people even after they had died? So as some enslaved people were catching different illnesses and they were sick, some planters advertised to get rid of them because they're not going to make a profit off of them in the market too much. But there were some medical doctors that actually wanted to purchase sickly enslaved people because they wanted to do research or learn more about the particular illness. I found that there was another form of trade that I call the domestic cadaver trade that involved selling the deceased bodies or cadavers of formerly enslaved people in addition to all of the other blacks and whites that were sold as part of this cadaver trade. I was just focusing on those that were enslaved or formerly enslaved. So there was a market, and that market really was part of an ongoing sort of underground market in body parts that is still around today. You know, there's an illegal kidney trade today and, and all kinds of other illegal organ market that's going on even to this day, and that was happening even in the 16th and 17th century. And so planters did find that they could sell cadavers for anywhere from 5 to $30, sell them to representatives from medical schools that were then taking these bodies and using them as part of anatomical dissection and research for human anatomy courses. Were enslaved men and women, knowing that they might be sold in this body parts and cadaver trade, 
Were they able to resist participation in this trade in any way? That's difficult. I did find evidence of enslaved people fearing, and more so in the records of free blacks and whites that knew about this trade, fearing being exhumed. And so free people of color tried to find ways to protect their bodies by having night watchmen work at the cemeteries that they were buried. They also had, if they could afford to, put bells or somehow seal their caskets, the caskets of their loved ones. And they also wanted to just make sure that they were safe because they knew about this trade that was happening. So some of the evidence is around the records of free Blacks and also whites that knew about this. And we see this in newspaper articles where they'll talk about grave robbers and resurrection men taking bodies. Free Blacks could offer themselves better protection than enslaved people who, you know, during their lives were, quote unquote, their bodies were owned by somebody else or commodified by somebody else. And enslaved people didn't always have control over how they were laid to rest. But the people that were often being part of this illegal trade were those that were unclaimed bodies. They were bodies that didn't have representatives that were coming forth and claiming them. So they were from prisons and almshouses and other places. And those individuals had no protection into this trade. So some people would run away from or stay away from the quote unquote body snatchers who were also enslaved men. Many of them were porters or janitors at medical colleges and medical hospitals. And so some of these individuals were enslaved and their sole purpose was to work for the medical colleges and going into procuring bodies that were going to be used for dissection. But other than that, other than trying to protect the caskets for those that were free blacks, it's really difficult to know about enslaved people because sometimes they did not necessarily have the kind of elaborate funerals and burials that people that were free were able to have. Sometimes they were just put in a pine box, had a small ceremony at night on the plantation. Or sometimes the owner would say, well, you can do something later. You can have a wake later, but, you know, I'll take care of the body. It's just very difficult for us to trace that, though. One of the curious things I discovered in The Price for Their Pound of Flesh was that an entire insurance industry developed just so slaveholders could insure enslaved people's bodies. Dinah, Would you tell us when slaveholders began insuring their human property and what they needed these insurance policies for? Yeah, so the insurance industry, when you first find enslaved people insured, they come in the form of like marine records, fire insurance records, not initially in life insurance. So it was first because they were being transported as part of the domestic slave trade. You also find insurance policies on transatlantic slave trade ships as well. And so they would ensure the passage of enslaved people from one place to another. And that's where we first found records of insurance claims. And after that, you then find insurance companies deciding to invest in life insurance policies on enslaved people because they're seeing that's another space. And from the records that I found, although they were a little bit later than probably your listeners are interested in, I found enslaved children as young as age nine and as old as their 60s and 70s being insured through life insurance policies. Many of the insurance companies in your study seem to be based in the South. But as we know, the North always seemed complicit in the institution of slavery, even when those states had outlawed the institution. So I wonder if there were any Northern insurance companies that made money from offering slaveholders insurance for their enslaved people. Yes, Sharon Murphy writes about this in Invested in Life. The Baltimore Life Insurance Company is where most scholars get records from, and that was obviously further north. (laughs) It depends on how you, whether you consider Baltimore North or South, but some people say it's the Upper South, so they wouldn't necessarily consider that North. But there was the New York Life, MetLife. There were companies in New York that also had life insurance policies on enslaved people as well. It's probably time that we address the elephant in the room. I mean, to talk about the monetary value of people is difficult, and I've personally found this to be a difficult subject to talk about throughout our conversation. And yet, Dinah notes in the introduction to The Price for Their Pound of Flesh that she spent 10 years working on this book and with this subject. Dinah, how did you do it? How did you spend a decade grappling with this tough subject? Well, you know, a good portion of the time was spent with just the data. I mean, literally, because I was trying to write a book, the book that I initially wanted to write was a book that would qualify and explain and contextualize every single value of enslaved people that we had records of, if I could find them, using the data sets that were existence and the ones that I was creating myself. 
And I realized that the sample that we have is just not representative of the slave population. So I was doing all this work on regional analysis. And also, I'm very much interested in people. I'm trained as a social and labor historian. And although I was doing all this work on the economics of slavery, I realized that I wanted to know and I cared more about how enslaved people felt and what they thought. And I wanted to try to think about a way, sort of heeding to Nell Payne, I wrote an article, Soul Murder and Slavery. And in that particular article, she talked about how we can't bring enslaved people to a therapist's couch, but let's think about how they experience slavery and what is the impact of enslavement on them. So I shifted midway in this research and was trying to find a way to show and allow their voices, if I could, to be a part of this conversation. Because when we teach the history of slavery, we always talk about using multiple sources and multiple perspectives. But one aspect of this history that I felt was missing from conversations about slave values was how they valued themselves. And yes, it was difficult research. It was depressing. It was very depressing. And I've said this publicly and I've talked about this. But I do gain strength from the survival, the way in which enslaved people, their humor, the ways in which they found very creative ways to survive, the strategies and tactics they employed to try to purchase their families if they were able to do so, if they were fortunate enough to do so, those that made it to freedom and ran away. Those stories motivated me to continue on whenever I was having difficult days in digesting the material, because it's not easy to digest, literally and figuratively. And before we move into the time warp, what do you think is the greatest benefit of our knowing more about how early Americans valued enslaved bodies over the course of an enslaved person's life? Well, one of the benefits that I was hoping to provide was just a conversation about context as much as I could. And I think I probably fell short of that. I think people that were coming to the book expecting to see that opened up a book that was really about enslaved people and how they think and how they feel and how they understood themselves as commodities. That's really what the book ended up being about. But I think we gain understanding in 18th and 19th century commodification. We learn about the economics and how the economics of slavery changed based on a number of factors, right? I mean, not just technological advances, but also war. We know that the American Revolution had an impact on prices. We know that the other legislation, like the closing of the transatlantic slave trade, all these major events impacted the value of enslaved people. And for most of what I've read and most of what I found, some of those events, enslaved people were not as distracted by them. They were using those events as ways to manipulate the system and try to become free or try to live in a space of freedom, whatever that was for them, with their loved ones. And so they would manipulate their enslavers. Women would lie about whether or not they'd given birth. They would try to take their own children's lives. They would try to run away to create these families and these communities that meant something to them. And so for me, talking about commodification of bodies and how those bodies that were commodified as people and how they responded to it really opens up to me the way we think about the institution of slavery as a whole and the way enslaved people coped with being treated as a piece of property. Now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if the United States Constitution had not abolished the African slave trade in 1806. How would the continuation of this transatlantic trade have impacted the development of the domestic slave trade and the experiences of enslaved women over the course of the 19th century? Oh, wow. What if? Okay. So one, I think that natural increase among women, you know, them giving birth, I think natural increase would have continued to increase because even before the closing of the slave trade, we saw that planters, traders understood the value of women's bodies and women's reproductive capabilities. But I think if the supply continued, supply meaning the trade continued, I do think that that would have an impact on price. I think it would have an impact on price. And I'm wondering, I mean, this is all speculative here, whether or not the presence of American-born individuals and having African-born individuals imported, I wonder how if African individuals continue to be brought in, 
how that would impact the development of the African American community. And what I mean by that is we know that, as I mentioned earlier, people believe that some ethnicities were more rebellious. And so if you have a presence of some of those that were born free in different parts of West Africa and different communities, if they're then interacting with those that were born enslaved, I think it would make for a different system of slavery as we move into the 19th century if the slave trade had not ended. What that would look like, I have no idea. Now, what aspect of history are you researching and writing about in the present? I'm actually co-authoring a book with Callie Gross, who's at Rutgers University, called A Black Woman's History of the United States, which is sort of a, not really a textbook, but it's written for a large audience. And the arc of African-American women's history from arrival to today. And we're trying to cover stories of lesser known figures in African-American women's history. And that's the project I'm doing right now. And I'm also working on an article on something I talk about in The Price for the Town of Flesh, which is an article on the notion of soul value. Um, as I spoke about this book over the last you know, year or so, six months to a year, people had questions about how I look at this value where enslaved people value themselves. And so I went back now and I've been tracing narratives from major enslaved figures that people know, like Solomon Northrup and Frederick Douglass. And looking at what they say about the values of their souls and how they understood themselves as uncommodifiable human beings. And I'm trying to tease that out a little bit and talk about that in an article. Sometimes our conversations with historians leave us with questions. So how can we contact you if we still have questions about what we discussed today? Well, the best place is my website or my email address. My website is just my name. It's just www.drdinaramiberry.com. And my email address is D is in dog, R is in red, B is in boy at austin.utexas.edu. And I'd be happy to answer questions. Dinah Ramey Berry, thank you for helping us explore how early Americans valued enslaved bodies and how those values changed over life cycles and time. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been my pleasure. There's no question that slavery was an economic institution that turned human beings into commodities or products to be bought, sold, and traded. Now, commodities need values in order to be bought, sold, and traded. And Dinah just revealed details about how early Americans ascribed monetary values to enslaved men, women, and children throughout the course of their lives. As Dinah revealed, early Americans considered several factors when trying to determine the monetary value of an enslaved person. They looked at age, health, parentage, place of birth, skill set, And in the case of women, how many children they had given birth to? Age served as a function of value. Dinah found that valuations of enslaved people followed a bit of a bell curve. As babies and children, enslaved people held small values, which increased as they aged, with women reaching their peak monetary values somewhere between the ages of 22 and 25, while men held their values into their early 30s. But after those peaks, the value of enslaved people began to drop as they aged. What's striking when we look at slavery in this economic light is just how many early Americans viewed enslaved people as being similar to animals. As Dinah mentioned, early Americans often use the language of animal husbandry to describe enslaved people, especially women. They use words like breeder and good breeding wenches to describe enslaved women both as actual producers of enslaved children and as people with the skills needed to rear, raise, and nurse children. Or they used clinical and unfeeling terms like increase, to describe an enslaved woman's ability to birth children. With that said, it's also striking that Dinah found evidence suggesting that across the board, enslaved people didn't really care about their prices and values. Instead, they had more human concerns, such as whether they might be bought or sold away from their families and loved ones. So to help ensure that they stayed with their loved ones, enslaved people often used the valuation system to their advantage by feigning illness and failed strength while on the auction block or by showing off their health and stamina when they needed to. All evidence that while many early Americans viewed enslaved people as commodities, enslaved people were in fact people. Thinking, feeling beings, all with the will to survive. You can find more information about Dinah, her book, The Price for Their Pound of Flesh, plus notes for everything we talked about today, on the show notes page. benfranklinsworld.com slash 176. The Omohundro Institute wants you to help historians and archivists transcribe the handwritten documents of the Georgian papers. To join their team of citizen transcribers, visit 
benfranklinsworld.com slash transcribe. This episode benefited from the production assistance of Holly White. Thank you, Holly. Finally, what questions do you still have about the economic side of slavery? I use all the questions and topic suggestions you send me to help plan episodes for this show. So send me an email with all your ideas and questions to liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.